Tony Herndon. I was born in High Point, North Carolina, which is a uh, central part of North Carolina, in 1969. That was six months after the Beatles' uh, last concert. And a month after I was born, uh, Neil Armstrong stepped foot on the moon. And of course, we were in the middle of the Vietnam War. When I would come home from school or later swim practice, uh, we, we would always have the news on. So everything revolved around this TV. You know, and by then they were, I, they weren't color in the beginning, but they were quickly after that color. But uh, I always remember Walter Conkright saying, That's the way it is. This is Walter Grand Guy. Good night. So my, my dad, my father was, uh, he was a veteran of the Korean War. He had one achievable event that uh, I remember when he was talking about that, which he didn't talk much about it, was that uh, towards the end of, um, the war never ended, but as it uh, winded down, there was a uh, group of uh, North Korean platoon that surrendered to him. So we had this relationship that was good, but it, uh, it wasn't like the one with my mom. Obviously, I think most guys probably would echo that, but uh, he was the coach of our uh, little league teams, you know, football, basketball, baseball. And I always liked that aspect, not because he was the coach, but just because we had a different relationship when he was the coach than, I guess, when I came home. My mom uh, was what we would define now as a homemaker. It was very traditional back in the 60s and 70s. And so she was the one that um, would get up at 4.30 and take me to practice, and then, of course, pick me up, bring me home, and then I go to school, and then the thing would recycle at 3 p.m. or 3.30 to 5 or 6 or whenever practice was over. The, in 1985, uh, there was this uh, um, swim meet that we would always go to, and it was uh, in South Carolina. So that morning, I remember we got up and I was looking at the elevator and then the window to exit the hotel was over here and she was driving this white Mazda 626 that she had and she pulled up and then the door was open, people were going out or something and then she said something and, you know, in the typical teenager mentality, I didn't really focus on what she said, but I asked my coach what she said and he said, uh, she said, good luck and she loves you. And so, you know, I echoed that back and that was the last time I ever saw her was, I remember I went back to practice the next day. Um, we swam in this pool that was covered with a bubble during the winter, and so we had these doors that would rotate. And they were kind of loud when they would rotate. So I remember looking up in between sets when the door would rotate and hoping my mom would be coming in like she used to come in. Most people that know me uh, think I'm fairly competitive or understand I'm fairly competitive and athletics is a good example of that. Uh, I enjoy competitive athletics because it takes commitment, structure, uh, sacrifice and one of the benefits is if you're fit then, then uh, you're in shape and that's healthy generally so that's, that's a good aspect of uh, being competitive. I usually key in on big events, um, you know, Boston Marathon, New York, Chicago. I did Ironman competitions for a while. So 
So I've been happily married for 20 years. I have three kids, and we met in Chapel Hill in medical school. My wife's a physician as well. Um, we spent six years in Connecticut with residency, and then two years in Indiana with uh, my fellowship in pediatric uro uh, urology. So uh, both being a physician, she understands the commitment that uh, being a surgeon takes. The other aspect of being a surgeon that uh, most surgeons you talk to have all their cases stuck in their head and they'll come home and even though they're home, the cases that they've been dealing with are kind of running like a, a center loop in their head kind of over and over and over. So that can be a little challenging to, to live with as well because you're done with work but you're not really done with work because you're constantly thinking. So one of the neat aspects of surgery is the relationships that you build with the families. Um, I think that's critical and I try to do that from the first time that I meet them. I make, try to make them feel like they're the most important uh, person that I'm seeing that day. And there's a lot of memorable patients, the ones that uh, that stick out, stick out for various reasons. Uh, one that I can recall was uh, a little girl named Mimi. I didn't have the heart to tell the mom that she was born on my birthday because I, I really didn't know if she was gonna make it, to be honest with you. Um, I've spent most of my adult life either in pharmaceutical sales or medical sales. And Tony is the most non-typical physician I've ever met. Um, he's especially unlike any surgeon I've ever met. Normally those guys come in prior to a case, they're with you during the procedure and after. There's very little follow-up and that just wasn't the case with him. Yeah, I, I, I think for us, you know, um, going through the, uh, everything that was going on with Mimi and our concern, the fact that, that he, was, he was there even after the surgery and, and they are checking on us daily and I, I felt like that was just um, very out of the ordinary for a physician to continue her care with the family after, after the, the procedure is over and uh, just really impressed by his he had, bedside manner. He has some sort of inner drive that I've not quite seen in anyone else. Something that makes him want to do everything he does perfectly and he seems to, that's what seems to make him tick. And we knew he had tons of things going on with his you know, own young children and wife at home, but he always put us, we always felt like we were first, and he's just great. You know, when I'm in the operating room, uh, things are very uh, structured, they're set up, uh, my operative notes I actually dictate operative theater. Um, that does stem from kind of what it used to be in the beginning was actually a theater that uh, called the Pit, and uh, folks would would tra would travel many 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 miles to sit in this theater, and then the operation would take place in the center of the theater, and so it it was. Uh, quite an event back then. Um, anesthesia has really allowed us, the advancement of anesthesia has allowed us to, to do uh, a lot of things more humanely. And, uh, and so it's, once you go back to the OR, um, I think it's much different than what it used to be. Uh, however, I still have that aspect in my head that it's, uh, you know, theater and, and it's, you know, it's a form of art that, uh, that takes place when, when we're trying to address what we're trying to address in the operating room.
I've, uh, family-wise, we've been in Charlottesville almost four years, and uh, similar to when I moved to Alabama, I do feel a sense of um, commitment to the community. It's interesting if you talk to people, they talk about the great generation and they compare it to the one we're living in and, and those sorts of things. I think, uh, I think all generations are great. Um, if you look at my parents, the you know, commitment, Korean War, my mom's commitment to me personally in terms of uh, the sacrifices she went through to get me to swim practice every morning at 4.30, uh, things she couldn't do because she probably was tired from doing that. Um, and I think that was passed on to me and it comes fairly natural to echo that commitment back to the community.